miracle that this mountain's talk It's a miracle All the words you bring To this voice as my heart does sing You're the good thoughts Running through our heads In the golden sun and our daily bread In the mountains and the ocean shore in all heaven and earth who could ask for more you are the eagle in its winged flight the hoot of song in the starry night every baby in its mother's arms sweetest angels that keep us from harm of all the miracles before our eyes that bring sweet joy into our lives you gave your life you gave it all you love's the greatest gift of all the greatest miracle I'd like to begin with a chant. <clears throat> Om Banme Manatsi Pratishtita Manu Me Vachi Pratishtitam Avir Avir Mahidi Vedasya Maa Nishtaha Shutam Me Ma Prahasi Ane nadite na horatran sandatami, Ritam varishyami, Satyam varishyami, Tanma mavatu, Tad vaktara mavatu, Avatu mam, Avatu vaktaram, Om shanti, shanti, shanti. Om. May my speech be one with my mind, and may my mind be one with my speech. O thou self-luminous Brahman, remove the veil of ignorance before me, that I may behold thy light. Do thou reveal to me the spirit of the scriptures. May the truth of the scriptures be ever present to me. May I seek day and night to realize what I have learned from the sages. May I speak the truth of Brahman. May I speak the truth. May it protect me. May it protect my teacher. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us all. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. Today we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to share with you a story of one of three women devotees who were in some way connected with Swami Vivekananda. They met and they knew him, uh, Sister Lolita, uh, and we also have uh, Ida Ansel, known as Ujala. She used to take shorthand notes of Swami Vivekananda while he was speaking in America, and they were later published in the complete works of Vivekananda, and then Miss Josephine McLeod, who called herself Vivekananda's friend, because Vivekananda was to her her very own self. So let us begin with She Touched God. During the 1970s, as a young nun at the Sarda convent in Santa Barbara, I heard many stories about Sister Lolita from Swami Prabhupananda and senior nuns who had lived with her. These stories inspired me and made me feel privy to a rich oral tradition of our early Vedanta movement 
in America. In the next 40 minutes or so, I would like to share some of these stories that described a saintly woman whose life of quiet strength became a role model for those sisters who had lived with her. To them, Sister Lolita was also not only one of the few then living followers of Swami Vivekananda, but by inviting Swami Pravavananda to open a Vedanta center in her home at 1946 Ivar Avenue. She made it possible for an important Vedanta work in Los Angeles to take root. For these reasons, her story is an important contribution to the early history of the Vedanta movement in America. Sister Lolita, or Mrs. Carrie Wyckoff, lived from 1859 until 1949. She was one of the three Mead sisters whose family hosted Swami Vivekananda at its rented South Pasadena home, now the Vivekananda House. During the winter of 1899 and 1900, which was during Vivekananda's second visit to the West. Swami Turiyananda, a direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, also visited the Mead sisters for two weeks in the summer of 1900, initiating Kerry Wyckoff in the rose garden of the Pasadena house. And later, Swami Triganatita, another direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, who gave her the name Sister Lalita. But, as Pravrajika Prapaprana explained, to those who knew her in her later years, she was simply sister. In fact, this affectionate term of endearment, sister, best encapsulates Sister Lalita's greatness her unassuming nature and natural humility. Though she had associated intimately with the three direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna in December 1929, turned her home over to Swami Prabhavananda, along with a hefty monthly annuity and donated 10,000 of the $12,000 necessary to complete the Hollywood temples in construction. Sister Lolita never put herself forward or assumed any airs of ownership. When in the summer of 1941, Phoebe Nixon, later Pravajika Prapaprana, first came to the Hollywood convent, she remembered how she saw, quote, an elderly white-haired lady bending over from the waist, weeding and tending the plants. This was sister, quiet, productive, and self-effacing. To those who knew Sister Lolita, her love for gardening was more than a hobby. It was her passion, her worship. Roses were her favorite flowers and she insisted that they be watered separately. Even in her 80s, Sister tended her garden so that flowers were always available for the daily worship in the shrine. Yanada, or Anne Lowenkoff, who was a resident of the Vedanta Center during Sister's life, reminisced how she was completely ignorant and had been a, gumbling, a grumbling conscript in her mother's garden until she met Sister. Serving Sister Lolita was a joy, Yanida wrote to me. All I had to offer was a strong back, ignorance, and pleasure in being with her. I wish I could convey the delight on her face and in her gestures 
as she'd planned, saying, we'll make a fairy land of flowers. She infused me with her delight. It's with me till this day. Okyanada, Prapaprana, and those who knew Sister have long since passed away. But um, uh, several of the nuns here, uh, Vrajaprana, uh, Krishna Prana, myself, of course, met these women who passed down this oral tradition. Following in the footsteps of his master, Swami Brahmananda, Swami Prabhavananda used to instruct his monastics at the center to garden at least one hour every day. Working with the soil, the Swami explained, cultivates honesty and simplicity, necessary prerequisites for spiritual life. These qualities were embedded in sister's character. Be pure, be strong, and be true were the teachings she had received from Swami Vivekananda and his brother disciples, and they were the precepts she lived by. Once as Sister Lalita was preparing food in the Pasadena home, Swami Vivekananda, who was pacing back and forth in the kitchen, suddenly asked her, were you happily married? Sister Lolita hesitated, then answered, Yes, Swamiji, whereupon he remarked dryly, I am glad that there was one happy marriage. <laughs> the moment passed, but Sister never forgot it, and years later she became known as a stickler for the truth. Truthfulness is purity, and purity is strength. Sri Ramakrishna used to say that truthfulness is the austerity of this age. To speak without embellishment, self-aggrandizement, or injury to others is a test of one's mental clarity, egolessness, and even-mindedness. But Sister always adhered to Sri Ramakrishna's signature teaching to tell the truth, but never a harsh truth. Once a woman came to the center, proudly wearing a rather garish hat, and I believe this was Miss Josephine McLeod, who became quite a character. When asked how she liked it, Sister softly replied, that's a beautiful ribbon in the band. Swami Vivekananda once said, as I grow older, I find that I look more and more for greatness in little things. I want to know what a great man eats and wears and how he speaks to his servants. In this sense, Sister Lolita, her greatness shone most brightly. Swami Turiyananda once told her, you will have a work to do, but it will be a quiet work. You had to discover Sister Lolita one devotee remarked. It was very easy to pass her by and go where all the activities were. But if you paused and got to know her, the least little thing you did for her made you feel rewarded. I don't know how to explain it, but you felt good if you did anything for sister. So how many of us can make other, others feel good, not to speak of blessed, but sister could, and that was her strength, to transmit goodness and strength to those around her. I asked Yanada what it was like to live with a sister. I got to serve her morning tea, Yanada wrote back, never a grumpy word, even when I was late. Instead, her enthusiasm for the day ahead. Never once in all the time I was in her company, and despite all my many shortcomings, did she scold. I've never known anyone who reported being scold by, scolded by her. She could disapprove. There was a certain regret. 
In her voice when she spoke of a particularly flamboyant member of the Vedanta household, but backbiting gossip was foreign to her. And here we see Ida Anso, Sister Lolita, and Josephine McLeod, the two women who passed away in our center who had met Swami Vivekananda. Gyanada went on to write, I don't know anything about her spiritual life, except that I felt it whenever I was near her. She blessed me, not with words, but with love and being, blessings that hold me still. And Gyanada wept as she wrote these words. So from where did Sister Lolita's greatness come? Sister herself once confided to Sudira, Helen Hall, a long-time devotee, a telling incident. At the house in Pasadena, the bedrooms were on the second floor. And if you ever get a chance, please do go to the Vivekananda house is something special. Steep, narrow steps connected the first and second floors, Sudira reported. One morning, they were all coming down to breakfast and sister was right behind Swamiji. Suddenly, she got a little unsteady on those steep stairs and she reached out in front of her using Swamiji's shoulder to brace herself. According to sister, the whole world just went away. She was in another place, in another consciousness, and she never remembered getting down the rest of the stairs. But somehow, he got her into the dining room and seated her, and then he took over. And he was so charming and so entertaining and so much fun that nobody noticed that sister was all blanked out, that she was in another place. Just touching his shoulder had taken her there. From that moment on, Swamiji was God to sister. Sudira recalled how those who heard this story were moved by sister's reverence when she stated, he is God. Undoubtedly, sister Lolita's inner experience on the staircase, hidden from the view of those who were present, was what nourished her later spiritual life. The sheer memory of that experience alone would undoubtedly have fueled her daily meditations and lifted her consciousness to a place where others such as Gyanada could feel a special sense of being, or as one nun expressed, a radiant serenity emanating from her. Still another verified, I always felt in her presence something quite wonderful. Sister was regular in her meditations. Even in her 80s, she went to the shrine three times a day Prapa Prana remembered how she would come into the shrine like a feather and sit cross-legged for an hour without moving. Christopher Isherwood, who was living living in the Vedanta Center in the early days, used to marvel at seeing Sister in the shrine room. She had an air of unobtrusiveness, Isherwood wrote, which was somehow majestic. Once, Sister Lolita apologized to Swami Prabhavananda for taking too long to prostrate before sitting for meditation. Sometimes it took longer for the light to appear, she explained, assuming that everyone else also saw the light when prostrating in the shrine. On Swami Vivekananda's puja day, Sister Lolita would offer a special breakfast in the shrine, which has since become a tradition 
at the Vedanta Society of Southern California. However, when Sister served the breakfast, it was as if she were back in the time at 309 Monterey Road, serving Swamiji his American breakfast, consisting of orange juice, two fried eggs, two strips of bacon, two pieces of toast and marmalade, and two cups of coffee with milk and sugar, the second one of which he would always enjoy with a cigarette. Those who attended this morning service related how they felt that it was not simply a ritual. Vivekananda was there. On the last Vivekananda Puja celebration that Sister Lolita attended, she left the temple and went to see Swami Prabhavananda, who was too ill to attend. According to Aboya, Mrs. Kent Driver, who was the Swami's nurse and also a wonderful devotee, Sister entered the room, took his hand, and said, They're all there. The Swami nodded in assent, meaning Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Swami Vivekananda, and Swami Brahmananda. Though Sister Lolita knew that she had touched God, undoubtedly her memories of her day-to-day -day relationship with Vivekananda during his four weeks' stay with her family and his personal teachings to her also kindled her inner life and infused her with karma yoga, her karma yoga with mindfulness, meaning, and joy. When she was cooking, one resident remembered the tiniest seed had to be removed from the grapefruit, and she didn't rush around and drop things like most people do. Sometimes we'd be running late to get food cooked for offering, and we'd think it would never get done on time. Still, Sister didn't rush, and still everything was done exactly on time, and it was good. Sister Lolita loved to reminisce about her days with Vivekananda, and though retiring by nature, at those times she would become especially animated. To her, he was a living presence. Sister Lolita's early relationship with Swamiji was far from formal or remote. It was that of a close sibling. He was just like a brother, Sister remarked. When asked what it was like to live with Vivekananda, she responded. He raised our consciousness up so we didn't feel why we were with him anything but just love and joy. And he was so much fun. But no matter how informal and intimate her relationship with Swamiji was, it was not without awestruck moments when she and her sisters would suddenly realize that Christ himself was living in their midst. When Swami Vivekananda came to live at 309 Monterey Road, the small two-story, three-bedroom Victorian-style house was filled with a Mead household. Mr. Jesse Mead, his three daughters, Helen Mead, Alice Hansbro, and Carrie Wyckoff, the three graces, as Swamiji called them, and Dorothy and Ralph, who were the children of Alice and Carrie, respectively, plus the housekeeper, Miss Fairbanks. And for a few days during Swamiji's visit, Miss Josephine McLeod also stayed with the Meads as their house guest. And when you go to the Vivekananda house, you'll remark, as I did, how tiny the rooms were. The house is really very, very small, and all these people were living there. Swamiji, who had his own room upstairs, felt relaxed within this household. His room is now a shrine. Every morning, he would come downstairs to breakfast, hair wet and tousled from his bath, 
and wearing a worn black and white herringbone tweed wart ba bathrobe tied at the waist. Before breakfast, he would take a walk in the garden behind the house or in the driveway at the side of the house, sometimes lost in thought, or sometimes he would chant or sing aloud. Breakfast, which sister prepared, was leisurely, and as there was no 10 o'clock morning class in Pasadena, the Swami would play with the children, read a book or take another morning stroll in the garden. Swamiji was present at all the meals, and would sometimes invite students who had attended his morning classes, such as Miss Josephine McLeod and her sister, Mrs. Frances Leggett, to come to lunch. Mealtime conversations were always lively with talk of India or some spiritual topic. However, the sisters' favorite lunches were picnics on the knoll behind their house, attended by regular students of his morning classes. At those meals, Mrs. Hansborough related, the air would become surcharged with a spiritual atmosphere. On one of those occasions, a Swami talked uninterruptedly from 10 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. By the time he finished, Mrs. Hansbro remembered, the air was just vibrant with spirituality. The sisters cherished those moments as much as the Swami's cozy, casual downtime when he would relax on the couch after a meal calling out to Mrs. Wyckoff, you work so hard that it makes me tired. <laughs> well, there have been some Marthas and you are a Martha, referring to Mary and Martha in the Bible. Years later, sister would reflect, to think that I didn't sit and talk with Swamiji when I could have, but Vivekananda had patience with all of them. As Alice Hansborough related, he took away any feeling that he was superior to us. In the afternoon, Swamiji would often write letters, stories, or poetry, such as Who Knows How Mother Plays. Occasionally, he would give private interviews or sit for tea with family guests, sometimes in silence. Once when this happened, the departing visitor turned to the sisters and asked, does this gentleman speak English? <laughs> but by late afternoon, Swamiji was ready to help Mrs. Wyckoff prepare dinner. Sometimes he prepared chili hot curries, hand grinding the spices as he sat cross-legged on the kitchen floor. Then the Swami would fry the spices and butter so hot their eyes would smart from the smoke that arose from the stovetop. These were the times when Swamiji was at his merriest. Here comes Grandpa, he would call out. Ladies are invited to leave. Such choice episodes undoubtedly played themselves over and over again as some of Sister's most cherished memories. The Vivekananda Lila in South Pasadena was the fortress of sisters' inner life. Once Vivekananda asked sister if she liked one of his spicy dishes. Yes, she answered, but the Swami was not to be fooled. Was it true or just for friendship's sake, he asked. I am afraid it was for friendship's sake, came the reluctant response. In simple ways such as these, the Swami changed those whose lives he touched. After dinner, the table would be cleared, a fire lit, and the Swami would gather with the family and an occasional guest, such as Miss Josephine McLeod. 
He would discuss a variety of subjects from philosophy and religion to history, science, and politics, or read aloud from various books. Once to punctuate a discussion on Adwaita Vedanta, he read from his poem, The Song of the Sannyasin. Another time he read from his lecture on the need of a guru, until Helen Mead offered him his bedroom candle. Does that mean I must go to bed? Swamiji asked. Well, Helen replied, it is 11 o'clock. The sisters long remembered this. How could they have ignored his invitation for discipleship? But in their case, initiation was not a necessary formality. I have known all three of you before, Vivekananda once told them. And in the summer of 1900, he wrote to Mrs. Hansborough, you three sisters have become a part of my mind forever. What greater expression of acceptance could a teacher have conveyed to his disciples? It is curious to see how in sister's life, strength and humility went hand in hand. The first words that sister ever heard from Swami Vivekananda's lips were those of strength. On December 8, 1899, the three Mead sisters attended the world-famous Swami's first Los Angeles lecture in Blanchard Hall. God cannot be known to the external senses, Vivekananda stated then. The infinite, the absolute, cannot be grasped. Yet although it eludes us, we may not infer its non-existence. It exists. Then he went on in Gyani fashion to insert in no uncertain terms what, how, and where God the Absolute exists. What is it that cannot be seen by the outward eye, he said, the eye itself? It may behold all other things, but itself it cannot mirror. This, then, is the solution. If God may not be found by the outer senses, then turn your eye inward and find in yourself the soul of all souls. When I have realized that I myself am the absolute, Vivekananda continued, for me there is no more death, nor life, nor pain, nor pleasure, nor caste, nor sex. At the end of the lecture, he chanted in his baritone voice, I am existence absolute, knowledge absolute, bliss absolute. Sister Lolita had tasted that ocean of existence, knowledge, and bliss when she touched Vivekananda on the staircase in her home. She had touched God, and such a vast ocean of consciousness had swelled up deep within her that she lost normal consciousness. No doubt that experience served as a witness by which she was later able to measure all the events of her life. It was also undoubtedly the same source of strength by which she was able to see equality and spiritual strength in all those around her. Why else would she be sometimes prompted, prompted to step aside for even those younger than she to enter a room first? Sister Lolita knew, after all, that the ocean of consciousness that manifest within her was also present within all. That experience also gave Sister a working strength. She never hid behind a false sense of perfection. It seemed effortless for her to simply admit her foibles with a humorous, well, I needn't do that again, and then get on with her life. 
The sense of humor, a mark of her detachment, made her a natural peacemaker. Just relax, she would say, when tensions would build up between residents at the Vedanta Center. Don't hurry. Don't rush. Five minutes one way or another wouldn't make a difference. And people would listen. Pravajika Bharadaprana wrote me, Sister was sweet at all times and totally self-effacing. She walked so softly you could hardly hear her. But at the same time, she had strength of character and conviction. A charmed life is not what made Sister Lolita great. She understood tragedy and loss. In 1925, Ralph, her only son, was buried in a landslide and seriously injured. He lingered for three days afterwards. On the third night, Mrs. Wyckoff dreamt that Swami Vivekananda, knee-deep in ocean water, was walking towards the shore, carrying Ralph in his arms. When she awoke, she realized that Ralph had died. Carrie Wyckoff was dev devastated, and her health suffered from the shock and grief of her loss. However, this was not the first time that she had endured unbearable suffering. One day in 1900, after a severe bout of depression, Carrie Wyckoff reached for a pipe that Vivekananda had left behind on the mantel of the Pasadena house as a keepsake. I always leave behind something wherever I go, the Swami had said. I'm going to leave this pipe when I go to San Francisco. As soon as Mrs. Wyckoff picked up the pipe, she heard Vivekananda's voice. Is it so hard, madam? For some reason, she rubbed the pipe against her forehead, and her suffering was transformed into a feeling of well-being. That pipe now belongs to the Vedanta Society of Southern California. However, with Ralph's death, death in 1925, Sister Lolita's grief was finally assuaged in a different way. It must have been around about three years later in 1928 that Sister met Swami Prabhavananda of the Vedanta Society of Portland, who was lecturing in California at that time. She felt drawn like a mother to this young Swami. Because Sister also revered Prabhavananda as a teacher, she asked to help with his Vedanta work, first in Portland, then a year later, she invited the Swami to accept her home in the Hollywood Hills. As a Vedanta Center in Los Angeles. And today, this house is still there. It's a center for our bookstore and our offices. And there is a living room where we have set songs with visiting Swamis. Yes, Swami Shivananda, the then president of the Ramakrishna order, wrote to Swami Prabhavananda, I give you permission to open a center in Los Angeles. In December 1929, Swami Prabhavananda moved into Sister's home, the greenhouse at 1946 Ivor Avenue. Though Sister Lolita was in her 70s, she took over the cooking, cleaning, and gardening, and later performed a five-item worship in a small shrine room which was built onto the original house. And that room is still there, though it's used as an office now. Swami Prabhavananda took charge of the maintenance and the ministry. During the Depression, times were so hard that they ate only popcorn and milk for supper. 
But once Sister Lolita deeded her home at the Vedanta Society, there was no turning back. Swami Prabhavananda used to say, Sister and I lived together for more than 20 years, and there was a never a harsh word between us. Once he stipulated that all residents must first ask permission before leaving the compound, a rule by which Sister Lolita also complied. Sister, you don't have to ask my permission, Swami Prabhupada pro protested. But such was Sister's humility that she insisted, Swami, I'd like to ask permission if the others have to. Sister Lolita's greatness was that she never put herself above others. So close was the relationship between the Swami and sister that when in 1935 they traveled to India together, Prabhupada noted that Prabhavananda's mother, Gyanada, to the right of Swami, felt a certain jealousy seeing her son with sister. To sister, the Swami undoubtedly filled the void that Ralph's death had left her. But according to Prapaprana, the two women developed a sweet relationship, even with a language barrier. On the last day they were together, the Swami's mother placed his hand in sister's, turning him over to her. While in India, Swami Prabhavananda and Sister Lalita associated with two direct disciples of Ramakrishna, Swami Zakandananda and Vigyanananda, the president and vice president of the Ramakrishna order. Isn't Sister Lolita wonderful? Swami Vigyanananda remarked to Swami Prabhavananda. We traveled in the same car for so many hours and she never said a word. How quiet. This is a big difference between Sister and Josephine McLeod. Sister's quietude was extraordinary unprompted by shyness. Rather, it came from being completely at peace with herself. And I just interject that during that visit, Swami Prabhavananda purchased the little teakwood shrine that's in our Hollywood temple. And both of the direct disciples, Swami Bhigyanananda and Swami Akandananda, came to his room and talked with him for an hour each time while they were touching the shrine. So that shrine is especially blessed. In July 1949, Sister Lolita contracted pneumonia while staying in the Santa Barbara convent. Those who nursed Sister felt privileged to serve her. By just looking at her face, one would feel joy well up within. One, res one resident remembered Sister was always dainty and oh so feminine, Gyanada remembered. I love to look at her. Even though bedridden, she would ask that a ribbon be first put in her hair before the doctor came. But Sister was never demanding. When the nuns noticed that her bed socks were worn and asked why she had not asked that they be replaced, she gently offered, Oh, I was planning to go into town to buy some. Prapaprana noticed that as the end approached, Sister was detaching herself and withdrawing into another world. Another nun also observed, you could feel during these last days that Swamiji was with her. She would sometimes gesture as though she were trying to touch something. A few days before Sister Lalita passed away, Prapaprana remembered, Swami Prabhavananda gave her Ganges water and she repeated after him the names of Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Swamiji, and Maharaj, Swami Brahmananda, and Swami Turiyananda. She went on to say, Gyanada was in her room early in the morning of the 23rd July, 1949. A little sigh from sister caused her to look up. Sister quietly slipped out of this world, as quietly as she had lived in it, 
for after all, hers was a quiet work, but for those who had the privilege to know her, what a great work it was. I'd like to end with a guided meditation that Swami Vivekananda shared with Western devotees who accompanied him to Camp Taylor in the Redwoods. It's a meditation on strength. At Camp Taylor, he trained these Westerners in the ancient Indian Rishi forest dweller style. And he chose the elements of nature to expand their mind and heart. His American student, Ida Ansel, wrote, I close my eyes and see him, Vivekananda, standing there in the soft blackness with sparks from the blazing log fire flying through it and a day-old moon over overhead. Swami said to us, you may meditate on whatever you wish, but I shall meditate on the heart of a lion that gives strength. So let us join in this meditation by sitting straight in our chairs. And you can hold your hands loosely in your lap or at chest level, however you prefer. Close our eyes and take in three deep breaths, breathing in strength and expelling all weakness, all low mundane thoughts. Let us try to picture the lion in our heart. The heart is the center of our sense of identity, the center of our being. Let us dwell on the spiritual qualities represented by the lion. It radiates strength, fearlessness, majesty, mastery, freedom, The lion is a creature of the savanna. It has no enemies and therefore fears no one. It knows it is a match for all circumstances. Let us feel we are established in that strength. Know you are free. Strength blazes from the eyes of the lion. It illumines our heart. It courses outward into the thought channels of our mind, our veins, the sinews of our arms, hands, and feet. Our body is filled with strength. Our mind is established in strength. We know the self, the Atman, fears nothing, not even death. We are centered in that which transcends time, space, and all that belongs to this fleeting world 
of matter. Om Shanti, 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 peace, peace. Preamble. Preamble. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for coming. It's a joy. I'll meet with you outdoors. Okay. Yes.